Hello friends, my name is JJ. So one of my favorite video games of all time was the 1991 puzzle hit Lemmings, which was originally for the Amiga PC, but came out on basically every other system of the time as well. It was made by the British studio DMA Designs as part of Britain's large, but often overlooked contribution to video game culture in the 1990s. Lemmings was a creative and darkly comic game where you had to somehow navigate these tons of tiny little creatures from point A to point B without accidentally getting them killed by the myriad of savage obstacles that lay in their path. But what really added an extra touch of whimsy was the game's very unusual soundtrack. So the story behind it is quite wild. The first guy they hired to do the music thought it would be fun if the score was just a bunch of remixes of various highly recognizable pop culture tunes. His draft soundtrack has since been leaked, and it is a pretty amusing playlist of songs that a British man in 1991 might have considered broadly recognizable, including a couple of Beatles songs. <laughs> some theme songs from popular TV shows of the time. And a few random pop songs. Now, in a testament to how much smaller and less sophisticated the process of making video games was in those days, somehow it took until the very last minute for anyone on the Lemmings team to realize the obvious problem with this plan for the soundtrack. Songs by popular bands and TV shows are, of course, protected by copyright, which is to say they are the private property of the people who wrote, composed, and performed them, usually still living, and thus cannot be used on a money-making product without expressed consent. Copyright infringement lawsuits are filed in Great Britain all the time on even the shakiest allegations of plagiarism, so a game which just brazenly uses other people's music would be a pretty clear-cut legal liability for the Lemmings crew. So they brought in a new music director, a guy named Tim Wright, to basically redo everything, and he had just seven days to do it because they were getting near release day. And Tim had a really creative plan of how to salvage the spirit of the game's soundtrack without causing any legal problems. Instead of a soundtrack featuring the greatest hits of pop culture, he decides to make one featuring the greatest hits of the public domain. Public domain is basically just a fancy way of saying stuff which is not protected by copyright. British law says that creative works made by a British creator generally enter the public domain 70 years after the creator's death, which is why today any random Brit can make a quick buck selling a reprint of Pride and Prejudice, for instance. Every country has its own copyright regime, but generally speaking, most resemble the British system in terms of only putting a creator's work in the public domain after they've been dead for several decades. Britain is also a signatory of what's known as the Burn Convention, which obligates countries to respect the copyright rules of other places. Now, copyright law can be quite complicated in practice, and there are tons of exceptions and nuances and so on. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to this too authoritatively. But presumably, the Lemmings people did have a good lawyer because in February of 1991, they released their finished game with Tim Wright's public domain soundtrack. And as far as I know, they have had no legal problems since. Well, maybe a couple. But anyway, this gets to why I think that Lemmings is such a cool cultural object. Since the soundtrack aspires to be both recognizable and legally safe, the game winds up being a fascinating little capsule of what I would argue is some of the most culturally significant music in the Western world at least as measured by longevity. Here is how Tim described his process. I kind of chose which classic songs to cover at random, whatever popped into my head, really. Old folk melodies, Christmas hymns, and so on. There were some original compositions in there too, just to spice things up a little, along with some mashups where I'd blend two tracks or adapt known themes with my own melodies. So now let us go through Tim's soundtrack and you can see how many of his public domain hits you can recognize. And we will talk about the story behind each one and how they got to be so famous in the first place. All right, so here's track number one. 
was probably pretty easy to recognize, right? Its popular name would be the Can Can Song, with Can Can being a style of dance associated with French burlesque calls in the mid 19th century. The dance remains one of the most iconic symbols of French history and culture, and I suspect if you go down to the Moulin Rouge, there are probably still ladies can canning for tourists to this day. This specific piece of can can music is called Le Galop Infernal, and it comes from an 1858 opera written by the Franco German composer Jacques Offenbach, who died in 1880. Okay, song number two. The tune here is called Dance of the Little Swans, and it comes from a very famous ballet called Swan Lake, written by the Russian composer Peter Tchaikovsky, who died in 1893. Tchaikovsky's ballets were well liked by the Russian government during the Soviet times and were heavily promoted as representing the best of Russian culture. This push through touring Russian dance troops and the like helped make him a popular figure in the West as well, with the scores to his ballets now synonymous with ballet music music to a lot of people the world over. Next one. Now this one is interesting. The song is of course, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? A song that I, and I assume many other people in the English speaking world, just grew up learning as a kind of generic children's song. How much is that doggy in the window? I do hope that doggy's for sale. I certainly remember singing it in kindergarten. But in fact, this was actually a legitimate pop single from the 1950s performed by the singer Patti Page. How much is that doggy in the window? It was somewhat notorious in its own time just because of how cheesy it was. In their 2013 obituary of Miss Page, the New York Times writes, it is often cited as an example of what was wrong with pop music in the early 50s, a perceived weakness that opened the door for rock and roll. Now, as as the date of her obituary should suggest, there is no way that this song was in the public domain in 1991 given that both the original singer and composer, the famed American songwriter Bob Merrill, were still very much alive at the time that Lemmings came out. My guess would be that in those pre-internet times, the Lemmings legal team probably just assumed that How Much Is That Doggy in the Window was a generic nursery song, as I think most people do, and didn't consider the frankly stranger possibility that this was a song people quite recently used to listen to on the radio. Speaking of Tchaikovsky, this is another piece from his other most famous ballet, The Nutcracker. This is a piece called The Turkish March, which is one of the best known compositions of Mozart, the famous Austrian composer who began decomposing in 1791. Too soon? Mozart is considered one of the giants of European classical music, perhaps even the greatest of all time. His songs have been enjoyed for over 230 years, to the point where I think a lot of hardcore classical music people now even consider some of his most famous pieces, like The Turkish March, a bit cliche. This one is perhaps the best example we've heard so far of a truly public domain song, given the song has no recognized historical creator and thus can be said to truly belong to the public. The song is of course, London Bridge is Falling Down. London Bridge is falling down, falling down. One of the most famous nursery songs in the English world, but according to the Museum of London, we don't know when the rhyme was first sung. Some historians think the song dates all the way back to late medieval times, but the earliest record we have of London Bridge in English is from the 1600s. As is very often the case with public domain songs of uncertain origin, people have all sorts of theories about what they think this song is supposedly referring to. In this case, some imagined time in which the actual London Bridge was 
actually falling down, but there is little hard proof one way or another. Okay, so this next track is a bit long and it combines two very different pieces of music. The first half of this one will be a fun bit of culture shock for Brits and Americans alike. The British know this particular piece of music as a popular Christmas song called O Little Town of Bethlehem. I've heard a lot of British people talk about it as a song that they associate with singing in church at Christmas, specifically. American viewers, however, are probably scratching their heads right now because they're thinking, I know the song Little Town of Bethlehem, and that is not the music to it at all. Town of Bethlehem began life as an American song written by an American guy named Philip Brooks, who died in 1893. The music was done by another American called Louis Render, who died in 1908. However, in 1928, the famed British composer Ralph Vaughan Williams decided to bring the song to England with new and, in his mind, better music, and thus the UK version was born. <laughs> Williams died in 1958, meaning that his version of the song was also not actually in the public domain at the time Lemmings was made. And according to this random guy on YouTube, the Williams estate did indeed sue DMA Designs. The second bit of this track is even more brazenly not in the public domain. This is the iconic theme music from the 1966 Clint Eastwood film, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly as composed by the Italian impresario Ennio Morricone, who only died in 2020. I don't know how the Lemmings lawyers missed this one. Maybe they figured it was brief enough that they could get away with it, but from what I understand, this idea that brief musical clips can be used royalty-free is mostly just an urban myth. <laughs> I was a kid, I thought the beginning part of this song was maybe the Itsy Bitsy Spider, which is a popular American children's song. But no, this is in fact another example of a British-American culture clash, because the tune is actually from a song that all British children grow up learning, but for some reason never really made its way across the pond. A song known as Ten Green Bottles. Ten green bottles standing on the wall. Much like London Bridge, this is another true public domain classic. Songfacts.com says its origins have been lost to antiquity, but may go as far back as the 1300s. The second bit is one that I think many of us will know primarily from cartoons or video games. It's the Funeral March by Frédéric Chopin, a Polish composer who died in 1849. For a long time, this somber piece of music was considered standard fare to play at funerals. It was even played at the funeral of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. That really seems hard to imagine happening today. The song has now become so overplayed in pop culture, usually in sarcastic or ironic contexts, that it now seems to function more as a song mocking the idea of Western death culture rather than being a 
respected part of it. All right, and then from a cliched song of death, we pivot to a cliched song of love. This is, of course, Here Comes the Bride, or The Wedding March, written by the great German composer Richard Wagner, who died in 1883. The popularity of this one is one of those traditions that is said to have originated from the court of Queen Victoria. According to Time magazine, the 1858 wedding of Queen Victoria's music aficionado daughter is thought to have started the practice of having a full choral procession from the church entrance to the altar, and playing music as the bride walked up the aisle, a change from the usual practice of having music only at the reception. According to Elizabeth Hafkin Plex, celebrating the family, ethnicity, consumer culture, and family rituals. A patron of opera who loved Mendelssohn and Wagner, the princess chose the music for her ceremony. And because everyone in Britain in those days took their cultural cues from the royal family, pretty soon everyone was playing Here Comes the Bride at their weddings too. All right, and now the final song of Tim Wright's oeuvre. <laughs> the great American folk song, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain When She Comes, perhaps the most famous American folk song of all time. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. When she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. When she comes. Certainly among the most parodied. She'll be coming around the grabby daddy when she comes. She'll be safe from creeps and killers when they come. Then I'll eliminate the taxes that are breaking all our vaxes. <laughs> to play canasta and take walks around the mall. He'll be coming around the mountain when he comes, comes, comes. This one also has its exact origins, lost to time, but it is believed to have evolved out of one of the so-called Negro spirituals or plantation hymns sung by enslaved black Americans in the 19th century. An earlier version was known as When the Chariot Comes and had more explicitly religious language in it. Oh, King Jesus will be the driver when she comes. King Jesus will be the driver when she comes. Historians now generally believe that a lot of these songs had complex codes and metaphors in them, but once again, the specifics have been long forgotten. It is, however, interesting to think that a song that many of us now think of as a trite and pointless kid's song could have at one time been a song about Jesus freeing the slaves. So what do you think? I would say that this is a pretty good little snapshot of the Western public domain canon, and as such is a pretty good encapsulation of various pieces of Western music that have had enough relevance to remain part of our collective culture for at least a century. If aliens came down from Mars and you handed them this, they might not learn much about us from the game itself, but I think the music could be used to tell a pretty educational story about what the West has been up to over these last few hundred years. A story that I hopefully have just finished telling you. Are there any songs that you think deserve a spot in the great Western public domain canon? Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.